Hey, hey, hey. I'm Al Cavadlo, and we're working out. Thanks for listening to my podcast. My guest this week is Mike Fitch. Mike Fitch is the creator of Global Body Weight Training and the Animal Flow Workout. We had a great conversation. Unfortunately, there were a couple of little connectivity issues, so there's a moment or two where the sound gets a little funny. Hopefully, it won't be too big of a deal, and uh, go easy on me. This is my first podcast. (laughs) Well, let's go ahead and get into the interview. Part of why I'm interested in talking with you, Mike, is that I think we've had sort of parallel careers. You started off as a trainer in a big box chain gym, right? I did. How long ago was that? So let's see. So that was, I was 19 years old. I'm now 39. So that was 20 years ago. How about it? Yeah, and I was was in the city. I started at uh, an Equinox on 54th and 2nd. So you started in the industry before the onset of social media. How do you think that affected your career? Well, um, (laughs) you know, I I feel very fortunate actually to have started before social media. Uh, You know, Mm -hmm. social media, uh, well, you know, I mean, so you, myself, Ryan Hurst, uh, Logan Christopher, you know, like like those guys, our little posse of of guys who are all doing (laughs) Both both people I plan to interview at some point for anyone listening. Fantastic. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was just such a cool time when we were starting. You know, you had Al- alcavadlo.com, you had your blog slash website. Remember uh, blogs? Ryan Hurst. <laughs> What's that? Remember blogs? I do. I do. And so it was really cool because at that time, the space was completely different. Like, you know, what we were doing was seems a little almost archaic now because we were doing these full length tutorials that had, you know, good content that people could use. Mm -hmm. And we all grew organically through YouTube videos, essentially. And then whenever Facebook and Instagram came along, we continued to use those platforms to our advantage to get our message out. But man, it's just a very different landscape now. Well, let me rewind a second. And I'm just curious, when did you first start to think that you wanted to take your training online? You said you were a trainer at a big box gym. I imagine you were doing very well in that capacity. What spurred yes. the whole internet thing for you? Yeah, so I, I, it, it was when I turned 30 years old. So this was almost 10 years ago. And I had just gotten into body weight training. And so prior to that, I, you know, I'd done almost every modality that I, that was available at that time. And mm-hmm. I found myself in a place where I was just lifting a ton of weights and I was, you know, jacked and, and, and bulky and, and moved terribly all the time and felt <laughs> terrible all the time. And so I just decided, you know, what, I'm going to explore something completely different. And I got into calisthenics and got into body weight training. And it was so inspiring to me and my journey to just – just even the concept that you don't need anything else but your own vessel to continue to create uh, symmetry, strength, endurance, skill, like all of these physical attributes, you didn't need anything else. And, and to you me, had to that, tell the whole world. You were compelled. I had to tell the whole world. I had to, I had to share it with the entire world. And that was, that was the impetus or the catalyst for starting at that time what was global bodyweight training was, man, I just wanted to do video tutorials and share this thing that was inspiring me so much, just share it on a global level and let as many people know about it as possible. That's always and, the best reason to create, isn't it? Just because you can't not do it. Exactly. Yep. I, I couldn't keep it to myself. You know, I just wanted so to share. Global bodyweight training came before the animal flow workout? Yeah. Yep. So global body weight training really was all about, uh, yeah, just creative ways to do body weight training. And, um, and so that came first. And then throughout my, my, my new experience with different body weight disciplines. So at that time, like I was doing break dancing, I was, I was enjoying parkour. I was starting to get into basic gymnastics and hand balancing. Parkour was really hot there for a while, right? Oh, man, I loved parkour so much. You know, the thing was, gymnastics was great, but gymnastics was so rigid. And, you know, parkour for me, uh, just 
it seemed like such a better way to express and, and, you know, you could bend the lines and it didn't always have to be perfect. And coming from like a skateboarder background and a musician, I know Mm -hmm. you're a fellow musician, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. There's just something about improvisation, you know, and and I wasn't able to experience that so much in my gym, my small stint of gymnastics training, but uh, parkour just opened up so many different options. And really change the lens in which you would see your your landscape. When you started global bodyweight training, were you still working at a gym at that point, or you'd already left to go independent, or what was going on? Yeah, so I was working at a gym that was almost like a collective. So okay. there was, you, you uh, were not at Equinox anymore at this point. No, nope. How nope. long so were it, you there? At Equinox, I was at Equinox off and on for probably probably about seven to eight years, but that was from. I was with Equinox in New York, and then I moved to Miami, and mm-hmm. Equinox hadn't opened yet, so I was with Crunch for a little while before mm-hmm. Equinox opened. And then after I Basically left... the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's the exact same thing, right? Uh, so then I McDonald's left... McDonald's and Burger King of the fitness industry. <laughs> <laughs> so then I left Equinox, and I, I was independent after that. So I worked for a few uh, boutique gyms. Very good. Do you still take one-on-one personal training clients now? Uh, you know, it's funny, Al. I I really miss working with people one-on-one. Really? So I've I've only been teaching workshops for you know exclusively. I've been teaching them for probably five or six years, and so I miss the one-on-one experience. It's just such a different energy exchange. You must get people soliciting you for that, though, right? I I do, and, and typically it's. It's more so our animal flow instructors. So, mm-hmm. and I, I will do this from time to time. Someone will fly in to now I'm in Boulder. They'll fly into Boulder and spend an entire day, just book an entire day, and we'll train um, and just you know give them as much attention as I can within four or five hours. And wow. so that's a lot of fun as well because you get to really you know get to the nitty gritty. You get to do some cool assessments. That's a you long personal speak. training session. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. But I guess you have a lot of material to cover. It's true. You know, it's true. I, I find for me, I've gotten so accustomed to teaching long form workshops that when I do a one on one session for an hour, it goes by very fast. And I, yeah. I feel like a lot of the time, oh, man, I could train this person for much longer. Yeah. But usually they're pretty pooped at the end of the hour. So it works out all right. And you still do one on ones occasionally, right? I, I do. I have a handful of people who've been with me for a long time who when I'm in town, I, I still try to see as often as you know I, I can. But mm-hmm. I'm the same as you. I, I like doing the one-on-ones, and, and I wouldn't want to give it up entirely. So I, I, I mean, who knows? It's, it's a long life, and maybe at some point I'll be sick of that. But for now, <laughs> it's still, it, keeps, it keeps it interesting for me. And I get ideas for articles and things like that from conversations that I have with clients one-on-one a lot of the time. So it keeps the creative fire fueled. Yeah, and it keeps you in touch with what it's like to have one-on-one training yes. that way. Workshops, you you still know what it's like to be there as a one on one trainer. Absolutely, trainer-er. absolutely. You know, I still find myself sometimes at seven a.m. standing there looking at the clock, wondering when this person's going to walk in the door. Just just like any other trainer, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not too good for that. It keeps you keeps you humble for sure. <laughs> so you said you started your training career in New York, and uh-huh. then you were in Miami, and now you're in Colorado. That's correct. What led you to Colorado? You know, and it's funny, most people don't, I don't think, realize that we've been very close or been, have been close friends for a long time. Sure. And anytime I'm in New York, I always try to link up with you. And so, you know, we get a lot of opportunities to talk about our experiences and how, again, how parallel they are. But you know that I was doing the nomadic thing for two years. Yes. And so I was essentially moving every month to a new country. And, you know, for, the goal was to just get out there and make as many connections as possible and share the message as much as possible and, and give support and love to our instructors all around the world. But after two years of that, man, I was exhausted. I was completely exhausted and I was craving some stability and craving a home. And so when you got looking out of for- your system, right? There's only so long certainly did. you could do that. I certainly did. <laughs> So when looking for a new place to, to lay roots or to put down, you know, to put down roots, um, the prerequisites were it had to be a place that was, you know, had lots of options for activities. And mm-hmm. so 
Colorado certainly does. It has great weather. It's got great food, and there's you know good music. So ticked all the boxes. I was in Miami before that, so I traded in the beach for the mountains, and I've been here almost a year. Right on. So you're comfortable there, planning on staying indefinitely? Uh, for now, yeah. For now, I'm here. And so excellent. So how many workshops are you personally teaching nowadays? So. This year, I will teach two two level ones, uh, probably three level two in advanced flow designs. But my main focus now is in what we call mentorships. So we do one mentorship a year. This one's coming up in Thailand. And then we do a couple of smaller retreats again, which uh, we just had one in Breckenridge, which was, a, which was a lot of fun. So I'm not teaching nearly as much as I used to. So a lot of that now goes or falls on our master instructors. I know for me, I can be a little bit of a control freak about my certs. And that, that's part of why I only teach about 10 or so a year. But how do you deal with relinquishing that control with so many other people teaching them on your behalf now? <laughs> well, it, it wasn't easy in the beginning, let me mm -hmm. tell you. And, you know, I always love to give credit to the creator of Viper and Institute of Motion. And he was he gave me a lot of great advice in the beginning. And one of the pieces of advice that he gave me was, you know, when you're creating a team around yourself to, to deliver your information, don't try to find replicas of yourself. Like don't try to find these mm -hmm. cookie cutter replicas of yourself, find people who are their rock star, you know, rock stars in their own right. And so that made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And so when we started looking for people to teach the animal flow certifications, uh, one, we we needed to make sure that they could teach because we want the the experience, the presentation to be really solid all the way across the board, albeit different depending upon the master that's delivering the information. Um, and we we said, you know, look, we can always make someone a better or more efficient mover, but it's really tough to teach someone to be a great presenter. Yeah, and I agree. So, and so whenever we took, you know, we would we would really spend our time finding these different potential master instructors and then, you know, see if they're interested. And then it's usually about a year long process of training them to where they can actually teach a workshop on their own. Mm -hmm. And so within that year, I mean, they're spending a lot of time with me. And so we're getting to the, you know, to get them up to the point where I feel comfortable of going, okay, you can take this on your own. It takes quite, quite a bit of time. But then also the other thing, Al, is that our goal is never to expand quickly. And so we're we're eight years into this thing, and we now have brought we now have eighteen master instructors, but that means globally. So like that, we can potentially have eighteen workshops going on at one time. I think but, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, and this year we'll have over two hundred workshops. That's amazing! Congratulations. Um, thank you, thank you. But again, the the goal wasn't to like just put the title on anyone and say, okay, cool, go go sure. go do the workshop and send us your our percentage. You know, right. it's like these are our family. We take them once a year or once every year and a half to uh, to a master instructor retreat where we eat, breathe, live, sleep, animal flow together. And so, yeah, it's it's quite the process. And uh, it did take a, a bit of, um, you know, relinquishing control, like you said, it took some time. You know, I've had the pleasure of sitting in on a couple of animal flow certs taught by Mike himself. And they're a lot of fun and you're an amazing presenter. And for anyone listening, if you have the chance to take a workshop with Mike, you definitely should. But I'm curious in, in your words, what people can expect if they're thinking about going to an animal flow workshop, whether you're there or not, I guess, because a lot of time they, they won't actually get to do it with you. Yeah, yeah. So I think an easy answer to that is expect to be humbled, but okay. in the best way. You know, and, and you is know, it's it, isn't never being our... humbled a good thing nowadays? Isn't isn't that the way the word's used? <laughs> <laughs> hashtag hashtag humbled. What's um, word? People say that when they win an award, they're like, Oh, I was so humbled that I won this award. Yeah. <laughs> that's what that's what they can expect at an animal flow workshop. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm going off on a tangent. Go right ahead. No, it's okay. I, I look. I, the, the vernacular <laughs> that we're working with these days in the in the social media space. It's uh, so when when putting together the animal flow program, you know. It was inspired by my experience in parkour, gymnastics, breakdancing, blah, blah, blah. And I was seeing so much value in these different disciplines. But, you know, my clients would never go and take, uh, you know, never go and join adult gymnastics, would never go and join like a breakdancing troupe or whatever. So 
putting together animal flow is a way of putting together some movements and some ground-based movements in a systematic format to where anyone could come in and feel really comfortable, really safe, and really successful, but it would still lend itself to get really, really deep and really, really technical. And so anyone coming in is going to, you know, feel challenged, but feel successful or, or will be allowed to feel successful. But in knowing that there's a long journey ahead of them if they choose to take it. So someone may come in as a trainer and go, oh, this is cool. I'm going to take three movements from this and I'm going to use them in my training. Or someone may come in and go, wow, this is potentially changing the way in which I see movement or training or, you know, longevity or whatever. It's, it's a very specific system. And I think that that's mm -hmm. something that I was very pleasantly surprised by uh, how nuanced and incredible intricate some mm. of the movements are and when you just watch other people doing them you don't always realize some of those little subtle cues that make the movement so effective do you get a lot of people coming in and they they think that they already have it down is that what you were alluding to when you said they get humbled and then they realize like oh i was doing this all not how it's supposed to be done yeah we see that all the time and to be honest what i meant by being humbled is a lot of guys come in, guys and girls come in thinking that they're very strong in yeah. whatever way. Yeah. But whenever you put them in a situation like this that may be very new to them or where they're having to manage their own body weight in conjunction with coordinating different movements, uh, it can be very like shockingly, holy shit, this is way harder than I thought. Absolutely. So that, that's what I meant by humble. But also, man, what you said is 100% accurate. We see that all the time where people are, think, oh yeah, I know this movement or I saw it on Instagram. I, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I watched and a they 15 don't... second video. I got this. Right. I got this. It's 15 <laughs> seconds. Pfft, nailed it. So to go in and show them, and, and like you said, there is, there is a specific reason, whether it be from an anatomical or biomechanical standpoint of why we have the heel here, the toe here, the arm here, like there's a reason behind every little mm -hmm. rule that we have. And so you can always, if you're experienced in the system, you can see when someone else isn't. Yes. And so it's, it's funny because we have people that like almost self-police the program. I'm like, guys, you don't have to do that. Like people are going to, as long as they're moving, it's fine. Right. I don't care. You know, you see someone coming to the program then they just go, oh, wow, there's way more to this than I thought there was. You, you had mentioned earlier in this conversation that part of what led you to it was you like the adaptability and the freedom of it. So mm. it's tricky to find that balance between having it be very specified and also allowing for freedom. Do you get students who start to become know-it-alls about it and, and get a little too nitpicky? <laughs> well, you know, we always say, uh, you know, suffer through the structure in order to conquer the chaos. And the structure is just putting the time in, right? So it's just like putting the time in to just repping out the basics, finding the lines, getting overly specific. And the chaos is after, after having done your time of not having to think about it and actually allowing yourself to free flow. Again, going back to the analogy of, or adding, you know, going, Going back to music, mm -hmm. same thing. Like you learn the notes, you learn the scales, and then eventually you can just, you know, improvise and jam or whatever. And it's similar with with the way we approach animal flow. It's like, yeah, you can eventually bend the lines and free flow, but first we're going to teach you the exact structure of every movement so that you can then bring your style and flair and freedom to it later on. So improvisation is never really fully improvisational, right? It always comes from a background of lots of very specific work. I fully agree, yeah. You've done so much already in your career. Is there something you're most proud of, or, or maybe I should say most humbled by? <laughs> you know, honestly, man, as cheesy as this may sound, you know, it, it, it was never my goal to be the best at anything. Like it was never my goal to be the best mover or the best calisthenics guy or whatever. My number one goal was to affect the most people. Right. And so 
from an hour to hour basis, I couldn't do that as a personal trainer. And so this gave me a vehicle in which I could affect people globally. And so to me, that's probably the thing that I'm most proud of is that every morning I can open up our instructors Facebook group or I can go to, to IG or whatever and see people all over the world doing this thing and just seeing them doing it and knowing that then that then that they are then going and affecting all of their clients mm-hmm. is just that's very, that's a very proud idea to me yeah. and so that's that's something that I that gives me a, a full heart for sure sometimes people ask me what my training goals are and my answer now is basically what you said my goal is not about me anymore it's about my students it's about how many people I can teach and how much I can spread uh, my my passion and my knowledge about what I do and uh, yeah it is it is a really surreal and satisfying feeling to see people out there who you've never met who you've still influenced in a really positive way yeah and you know it it kind of goes lends itself to that idea of like being a teacher, being a student, or even being a leader, being a servant, you know, and I certainly see what we do as being servants. I love the way you said that. You you have to be a servant to be a good leader. You do. I I learned that when I was working at the gym and I had a, a good manager early on who was always doing all these jobs that weren't really his job because mm-hmm. someone had to do them. And if somebody didn't yeah. re-rack the weights or put towels on the rack, there just weren't going to be towels on the rack. And then people weren't going to renew their memberships and people weren't going to buy training. And, and all of these things are connected and people get it into their mind like, oh, this is my job and I'm just going to do this. And even if this thing over here is being ignored, that's not my problem. But it, but it is your problem. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the workshop space where people are coming to see you. Um, yeah, you know, you could see where people fool themselves into thinking that, you know, they're the guru or they're the, the, the all powerful leader, but it's not true. People are coming to you, paying money to come and learn something from you. And there's a sacred relationship that you have with them. Yeah. And even though you are the teacher, you, you are there to serve them so that they can better serve other people. We're still in the service industry. It's so true. <laughs> and, you know, it's, 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 easy for some people to forget that sometimes and then uh, then the whole thing like you said the whole relationship can get a little bit complicated and screwed up it can it happens all the time and it's it's good to hear that that you're out there doing it the way you're doing it so what do you have on the horizon now you have any new projects yeah so we actually have a big project coming up this year we are launching a on-demand channel for Animal Flow. So this would be something that you could find on Roku or Apple TV. And it's a subscription site. But you know the cool thing about it is on that channel, we'll have multiple Animal Flow classes that have different expressions of the class. So oh, wow. maybe, maybe one's more mobility-based, one's more flow, one's more interval-based. And then we'll also have tutorials of all the level one and level two movements, as well as a huge bank of flows that people can just check out a flow or get a new flow each week. So that's on the horizon. We'll probably launch that towards the end of the year, more around fallish. That's big. Are you creating all new content from scratch or are you using some stuff from your other archives for this? All new. So oh my God, that's a big undertaking. It is. And we, so we've booked out an entire week of shooting in LA and we're going to shoot uh, the first round of videos there. We'll launch the platform and then we'll probably shoot new content quarterly. And so we'll just go in shoot a bunch of new classes, bunch of new flows. And then, um, you know, we'll take the feedback into consideration and modify the classes depending upon uh, the feedback. And are you going to have some of the other master instructors in this as well? Or are you going to be demonstrating everything yourself? We're definitely going to feature some of the other master instructors as well. So we'll fly, you know, we'll fly them in. We're in this shooting. We're going to have, I think, about four of our master instructors because one of the goals with the platform is we want to bring attention to our masters so that people, you know, get to know them a bit and they say, oh, "Cool, I want to go take a workshop sure. with that person." You've, you've got some heavy hitters in, in your team at this point. Yeah, yeah, they're they're total badasses. I love those guys so much and we're so happy to have them. And so we definitely want to bring as much attention to them as possible. So people can either go and take their workshops or do some one-on-one sessions. Uh, you know, a big part of this, this channel is we want to get people to then go find live instructors, find live classes, go take a workshop. 
Or if they choose to just enjoy it at home, they can do that as well. But if they really want to get all the nuances down, there's no substitute for that in-person experience. There's not. I, I see the same thing at the progressive calisthenic certifications I teach. People have been training these moves at home for months, sometimes years, and they show up and they say to me, Al, you just said one thing that just completely changed my whole approach to this exercise and, and now I can do it. And of course, the fact that they were training on their own certainly allowed that one cue I gave them to be so effective. Yeah, but absolutely. Sometimes there's just one little thing that they're just not getting and they just someone's got to see it and call them out on it because no matter how many times they watch a video and try to do it it's just this little little thing gets lost man yeah there's no substitute to the real real experience there really isn't um and you guys so how many of the pccs are you doing each year i'm doing around 10 a year now we're, we're trying like the same as you trying not to oversaturate it and i'm i'm too much of a control freak so me or danny at this point yeah. are, are the only master instructors who are who are leading workshops and you guys, for the most part, teach uh, together almost all the time. We right? teach together most of the time. Yeah, occasionally there's there's one that for whatever reason one of us does without the other one. But we have same as you. We have a lot of other you know team leaders and senior instructors who will will come out and assist at those workshops. And even even when Danny and I teach, we almost always have one or two other people with us because yeah. when the group's that big, you just you just need more bodies in the room to give instruction. Yeah, I just know how exciting it is for the attendees to come and see you and Danny. And to have the experience because we've had a lot of animal flow instructors come and take PCC and vice versa. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think they're really nice complementary methods. Without a doubt. Right on. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today, Mike. Is there anything else you want to let my listeners know before we sign off? Uh, you no. Know, other than than, uh, then keep come an eye to your out. workshops and keep the eye out for the uh, the new channel, right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And just uh, just continue to explore, you know, just continue to explore. And that's that's something that uh, one of the sayings I always try to pass on to people is, you know, go be bad at a lot of things. And you know <laughs> what I mean by that? you eventually get good at them, right? Yeah, exactly. So just expose yourself to things that you wouldn't typically gear towards or, or trend towards. So, yeah, go be bad at things because sometimes you might find the thing that changes your life. Well, I'm, I'm working on being bad at podcasting right now, so <laughs> I, I, I got something new for myself. <laughs> I love it, man. I'm so glad that you're doing this, buddy. Thanks. Thanks for, for being my guest. And if anyone listening wants to find you, you're on Instagram and, and Facebook and all that. So they just look for the animal flow or you have your own personal pages also, right? Yeah, and I'm, I don't put a lot of energy into my personal pages. And so okay, I would don't say, follow Mike. Just follow the yeah, animal flow channel. Exactly, exactly. Don't go to Mike. Don't go to Mike GP, GBT. Go to uh, Animal Flow Official or AnimalFlow.com or Animal Flow on Facebook. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mike. Talk soon. All right, buddy. Well, I hope you enjoyed the first episode of We're Working Out with Al Cavallo. Make sure you check out my sponsor, Zero Shoes. That's zero with an X. X-E-R-O-S-H-O-E-S dot -E -E com slash go slash Al Cavadlo. And tune in next week when my guest will be Austin Dunham.